Okay, review of simplifying radical expressions, which we are calling objective one here of unit five. Quick reminder from last year that the definition of a radical is that if you had an a, some base raised to an exponent of n, and that equaled b, then a, that base, would be the same thing as the nth root of b, and that's where you get things like a squared equals b, square rooting both sides or a cubed equals b cubed rooting both sides to solve for a. Couple of vocab terms here that I'm going to use in the explanation, so just kind of reminders. Uh, this power here that's next to your radical that's indicating the radical um, power is called an index, and the thing underneath the radical is called a radicand. Okay? And then a couple of additional reminders. If n is positive, then there is only one real nth root of b. So for example, if n was positive here, so we're looking at, at maybe um, x cubed equals 8. So I'm sorry, if n is odd, right? So x cubed odd number equals 8, then there's only one nth root of this value over here. If I were to cube root both sides, we'd have x is the cube root of 8 which there's only one number that comes out of that, that would be two. Similarly, if we had x cubed equals negative eight, well, if I cube root, cube rooted both sides, I'd have the cube root of negative eight, which is negative two. There's only one number that generates when n is odd, when my power is odd, an odd index versus when we have even powers, Right, so maybe x squared equals 4. Well, now when we solve, we actually have two real nth roots of b. There's a, a positive and a negative root that potentially could result from square rooting 4. This could be, could be positive 2 or negative 2 because either of those numbers, when I plugged them into x squared, I'd get 4 for them. And the principal root is the, the positive root the two in this case. Okay, that fact contributes to part of our simplification process. Okay, so some properties here. Um, property for nth roots of nth powers, that's when my index and the power within my radical happen to match. Okay, if you are looking at those n's and they happen to be odd, an odd index with an, a matching odd power underneath, then your answer is just the base, the a there. However, if you are looking at them at the end and they happen to be even, so maybe a, a fourth root with an a to the fourth or a square root with a squared, then you'll have an absolute value of a. And the reason for that is related to these kind of example roots here, which are ones you do need to memorize. Um, the reason for that is this. Okay, my odd roots, if I were to cube root this x cubed, I'd be asking myself, well, what number times itself three times would I be left with? This cube root and this cube would cancel, and I'd be left with just x. Well, now remember, x can be a positive or a negative number. It's a radical, I'm sorry, it's a variable. And so the question would be, well, if I plugged in a positive or a negative number, into this radical, would that, would that be possible? Could I, could I get a positive or a negative as an answer? And yeah, cube roots, they can be negative, right? Cube root uh, a negative eight can be negative two. I can generate a negative answer there, okay? It's a little bit different as soon as we throw even roots involved, right? Because if you see even roots, a, a square root with an x squared or a fourth root with an x to the fourth, well, think about that for a second. If I didn't have these absolute value bars here, if I just said that root x squared is x and didn't put an absolute value bar around it, well, now x could be negative or positive, right? It's a variable. The problem is this. This function here is inherently positive. It has to be positive because we have a number that is being squared. 
And no matter what number you plug in, whether it's positive or negative, when you square that value, you will get a positive number. It's mandated to be positive. And so that's why we need to have the absolute values around our x here to make sure that we state that this has to be positive. My function had to be positive here. And so the first thing we need to know is that when we see ourselves with even roots, okay, we need to know that these may need absolute values. Absolute value bars in the answer. But now it's not all the time. Just because I see an even root, I'm not just going to automatically slap absolute value bars around it. It's, it's in a very particular instance, okay? which is where these next properties come in. If I'm looking at a, a property of nth roots, of nth, 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 I think is how we would pronounce that, powers, um, for any real numbers a, and for m and n being even numbers. And again, we're going to focus here on the evens because remember odds, I, I don't care whether I generate a positive or a negative number, odd roots can be positive and negative. Again, think about those eights and negative eights. It's only the even roots that we might run into that issue. Okay, so we're focusing in on even. Okay, if you're looking at your, your function here and you see an nth root with an m power, I could rewrite this as a to the m over n. Okay? And that would be left as a to the m over n if m over n is even. And you'd have an absolute value if m over n is odd. Demonstrating that over here. Okay? When I solve this, right, I have the root of x to the fourth, which is adopting this process, right? x to the m over n. This would be x to the 4 over 2, which is x squared. I don't need absolute value bars here because that x squared is even. The bigger reason for that is because, again, think about that little positive and negative idea. I am saying here, in, in giving x squared as my answer, when I, no matter what x is, because I'm squaring it, that answer is positive. And root x to the fourth is positive. There's no chance of any sort of discrepancy there of, of getting a, a has to be positive on one and a negative on the other. Like both of these are inherently positive. Similarly here, we have x to the 16 over 4. 16 over 4 would be fourth. Well, x to the fourth, no matter what I plug in, that is going to be positive. And this is going to be positive, so I'm good to go. Versus over here, x to the 6 over 2, 6 divided by 2 is 3. If I didn't have these absolute value bars over here, think about that for a second. Depending on what number I plug in, cubing it does not necessarily mean I'm positive. If I cube a negative number, it's still negative. But my original function was x to the 6th, an even power, meaning this function is positive. This, this entire root x to the 6th, no matter what I plug in, this function here is a positive number. So I have to make sure that this x cubed is positive. I have to slap absolute value bars around it. Similarly, x to the 20th divided by 4, 20 divided by 4 is 5. Again, x to the fifth, if I were to put a negative number in there, that would be a negative value. But if I plug a negative number in here, that's positive. If I plug negative numbers in, I would be saying that a positive equals a negative, which is not true. This number has to be positive, and so we have to make sure this one is positive as well. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means what we need to make sure we check is this. Yes, even roots might have absolute value bars, but more importantly, it's not just the even root, it's the even root when you start even, so we're even and even, and we end up odd. Okay? So absolute value bars.
are necessary. When M and N, your powers here, start even, but M over N, my division here, the 20 over the 4, is odd. When you start even, but end up odd. Okay, so simplifying. We're going to go ahead and practice this. Example one, we are going to simplify each radical expression, use absolute value symbols when needed. Again, we really only have to worry about absolute values when we see even roots, and then we'd be looking to see, well, okay, if I have an even root, did I start even and end up odd? Um, other than that, I don't have to worry about absolute value bars. Okay, so simplifying this, we have the square root of 16. Okay, so you're asking yourself, well, what times itself is 16? The square root of 16 is 4, because 4 times 4 is 16. Next up, you have your x to the 6th. So you are square rooting x to the 6th. Okay, this is this m over n idea. So my 6 over 2, 6 divided by 2, is 3. Now careful, because notice we have an even index with an even root. That tells me I need to check, because if I have an even index with an even root, but my answer ends up being odd, I have to put absolute value bars around that. Even index, even root, that answer ended up having an odd power, and so I have to put absolute value bars around it. Okay. Next up m over n, the square root of y to the fourth, 4 over 2 would be squared. We have even index and even, sorry, even index and even power, so we'd be looking to see, do I need absolute value bars? But again, you only need absolute values when you have an even index, even power, and you end up odd. Well, my final answer here was even, so I'm good to go. Okay. Next up, number two, we have the square root of 81 x to the fifth, y to the tenth. Okay, so working our way down here, we have the root of 81. You're asking yourself what's a perfect square there. Um, so root 81 is a perfect square. The square root of 81 is 9. Okay, then we have our x to the fifth. The square root of x to the fifth, 5 divided by 2. We have our x squared and 1 left over x, right? Because 5 divided by 2 would be 2 with a left over 1. Or you could say 2 goes into 5 2 times and you have 1 left over. Okay, this is an odd power, so we don't have to worry about absolute values. Remember, odd, odd powers, odd roots. Um, so actually here, you won't ever have to worry about odd indexes or odd odd powers there in terms of sign, because odds can be positive or negative potentially. Um, the reason it's not super important with this one is because yes, while we have an even root, the fact that we have an odd power underneath already mandates that our domain is restricted to positive numbers. And so we don't have to consider whether or not um, an x could be positive or could be negative because my x can't be negative. Imagine plugging a negative number into that place negative to the fifth would be negative, and I cannot square root negatives. Those create imaginary numbers and we're working with reals. Okay, so you don't have to worry about absolute values when you see odd powers or odd indexes. <laughs> okay, um, moving on, we have our y to the tenth, so 10 divided by 2 is y to the fifth, nothing left over. Now we do see even index, even power, so we need to check, did I end up odd? Did I end up odd? I sure enough did, so I need absolute value bars there. Okay, number three. We have our negative 2x here, which is going to hang out. Okay, the square root of 25, thinking of a perfect square that goes into 25, that would be 5. Our 5 here. 
Moving on to our x's. 11 divided by 2, which is my index here, would be 5 with a leftover x. Right, because 2 goes into 11 5 times with one leftover. We have an odd power, so we don't need to worry about absolute values. Again, it's only even, even that ends up odd. <coughs> okay, y next, y to the 4, so we have 4 divided by 2, which is 2. We have even, even, but it ended up even, and so we're good to go. Cleaning this up, negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. x times x to the 5th is x to the 6th. Remember when you multiply like bases, you add their exponents. And then our y squared times root x. Okay, moving on. Numbers 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so now we're dealing with a cube root. Well, nice thing about a cube root, it's odd. So no absolute value bar is necessary. Again, one more time. Absolute values are only necessary when m and n start even, but your power ends up being odd. Okay, so we don't have to worry about absolute values at all here, because they're cube roots, odds. Okay, so we are simplifying x to the 9, so 9 divided by 3 would be 3, so this would be x cubed, Th or I, could, I should say 3 goes into 9 3 times. Okay, 3 goes into 10 3 times with 1 left over. And 3 goes into 17 5 times with 2 left over. Okay. So that's your answer. Okay, number five, cube root of 27. What's a number that goes into 27 three times? Well, that'd be three. Three goes into nine three times. Three goes into 12 four times. So that's your answer. Again, it's always the index into the power, right? In into your M here. N into M. Okay, last but not least, we have 3x squared hanging out. First up, we are looking at the cube root of negative 16. So I'm asking myself what number times itself times itself would give me negative 16. There actually isn't anything that creates negative 16. So then you're next going to be asking, okay, well, what is a perfect cube? that goes into 16. 1 cubed, 2 cubed, 3 cubed, etc. And in this case, our negative 2 would go in to negative 16 3 times, creating negative 8. Let me go ahead and show that, right? If we did negative 2 cubed, that would be negative 8, which would leave me with a 2 left over. If I were to rewrite that negative 16, it would be negative 8 and 2. And the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2 with, like I said, a 2 left over inside. Okay, x is up next. 3 goes into 7 2 times. So we have x squared with 1x left over. And then 3, my index here goes into 11 3 times. Looking at y cubed with 2 left over. And so then cleaning this up, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. x squared times x squared, leave the base alone, add the exponents, we have x to the fourth. y cubed times the cube root of 2x y squared. Okay, one more in this kind of simplification form, and we'll move on. So determine whether each expression is equivalent to 32x cubed y squared. Well, to determine whether it's equivalent, we, we'd like to know what root 32x cubed y squared equals. Okay, so simplifying 
I do see an even root here, so I'm thinking possibility of absolute values, right? So I'm going to be checking for that. If I have even and even and it ends up pause or odd, then I need absolute value bars there. Okay, first up we have the square root of 32. Well, there is no such thing as the square root of 32. So then you're thinking about what's the largest square that goes into 32? Okay, working your way up, you end up with 16 being the largest square that goes into 32 here. So if I wrote this, this would be 16 times 2 is that 32. If I square rooted 16, I'd have 4 with a 2 left over under the radical. Okay, how many times does 2 go into 3? It goes in one time with one left over. And this is an odd power, so we don't have to worry about absolute value bars. But lo and behold, even index, even power, so now I'm even more hypervigilant about the absolute values, right? Two goes into two one time, and whoop, what do you know? My power ends up being odd, so I do have to slap absolute values around that piece. Again, even index, even power, ending up odd, absolute value bars. Okay, so which ones of these are equivalent? Okay, well we have our 2x root 8xy squared. So again, simplifying this, 8 would be, um, for example, like 2 times 4, because there is no square root of 8, but I could split it up as 2 and 4. And I can do the square root of 4. That would be 2, so we'd have my 2x out here, the 2 from the root of 4 with a root 2 still left underneath. Square root of x is, is nothing, so that's just x. And then careful, even index, even power, so I know if I end up odd I need absolute value bars. Okay, the square root of y squared, 2 goes into 2 one time. And sure enough, because I ended up odd, I need absolute values. So the question is, is that, what I had here, is that equivalent to 4x absolute value of y root 2x? And the answer would be yes. We have 2x times 2, which is 4x. Absolute value of y times root 2x. And so these are equivalent. Okay, the next two are a little bit more straightforward. Answer is, would, would this one be equivalent to this? Well, no. Okay, those absolute value bars, their absence is an issue, right? Because without their absence, that y could be positive or negative. It has to be positive because I'm square rooting y squared, which is going to be a positive number. y squared is positive, right? And so we need those absolute value bars there. Okay, 4x, absolute value of y, root 2x. Well, that matches perfectly, so that's definitely true. And last but not least, we have our 16x, root xy squared, <laughs> um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure already for the record that this is wrong because this is 16 and that's 4. But <laughs> finishing out the simplification, just to model that absolute value thought process kind of one more time here, we would have our 16x, the root x would stay, but the square root of y squared, 2 goes into 2 one time, so that would be y, and because we have an even power with an even exponent but ended up odd, those would have absolute values. Issue here, should have been 4, it is 16, and we should have had a 2 underneath, and we don't in our radicand, so nope, those don't matter. Okay, next page. So now we move into multiplying. So reminder of multiplication properties here. So if we have matching roots, so square root, square root, or cube root, cube root, okay, then I can multiply those together to just be a times b. Right? Similarly, and again, these would have to be matching roots, square root, square root, cube root, cube root, something like that. Okay. Then our A and our C, which are on the outsides, they're allowed to be multiplied, and the B and D, which are inside, they could be multiplied and then potentially simplified further. 
Okay, and then here we have our root a times root a, which would be root a squared or a in this particular instance. Okay, so we are going to practice multiplying. We are still going to simplify. We are still going to observe the absolute value bars um, as they are, are necessary. Okay, so first off, we have our root 45x to the fifth y cubed times root 35xy to the fourth. Okay, so taking a look at here, where would I be looking potentially for absolute values? Well, in this one, the one that stands out initially is what I do see an even index with an even power, and so I, I would potentially be going, well, okay, maybe the y to the fourth there, but notice what's in the other term. y was already odd, right? Meaning that because y was already odd, we already have a restricted domain. Y we already know has to be positive. Because if I plugged a negative number into this term, if I said that Y was negative, well then I'd get an imaginary number. And I'm working with reals here, right? Over the reals. Um, so I can't have a negative under there. So actually we kind of luck out in this one because my only two variables that could potentially be absolute values, both at some point are odd. And so I'm not gonna have to worry about absolute value bars at all. Odds, odds don't have the absolute values. Okay, so we're just gonna multiply. Um, first step, using this first property, I can actually multiply my two terms together here. So we're gonna go ahead and rewrite this as 45 times my 35. I'm not actually gonna figure out what that is by hand. We have our x to the fifth times x, which is x to the sixth and y cubed times y to the fourth, which is y to the seventh. <coughs> okay, I could take the time to figure out what 45 times 35 is. Honestly, it's a little bit of a waste of time because remember, I'm trying to simplify it. I'm trying to pull out perfect squares. So my recommendation would be to look for, well, what are some pairs here that could create perfect squares? Um, for example, 45 has a nine in it. Well, I could pull that nine out and the square root of nine would be three. Now it would leave a little five in there initially, but then notice we would have a five left over from this one. Well, there's another five in this one. And so a five could come out and in that one fell swoop, the entire 45 is gone and what I'm left with is seven. And so inside the root, I'm gonna have root seven. Okay, then we have our x to the sixth, right? So the square root of x to the sixth, two goes into six three times. Okay, and then y to the seventh, two goes into seven three times with one left over. And then simplifying this, three times five is 15. And we've got our answer. Number two, number two, multiplying this. Um, we have our three, which is a coefficient. If I also had something outside my radical over here, I'd multiply them together, like the a and the c here in the second property, but I don't, so I'm just gonna let the three sit. <coughs> because these radicals match, I can combine them. Um, two times 10 is not too bad, so I'm gonna go ahead and write that as 20 although you could also do two times 10 like we did here in example one with the 45 and 35 if you wanted. But I'm gonna do two times 20, or two times 10 is 20. X squared times X is X cubed. And Y um, times Y is Y squared. Okay. Oh, I almost forgot to mention. So again, you'd wanna check to see um, if there were any absolute values you'd wanna be aware of potentially. Um, so the one that stands out initially is, oh, even index, even power. So potentially the x might have absolute value bars, but notice over here, x already is odd. Odd will never have absolute values. And y's are odd in both cases. So again, I already, am, I already have a restricted domain. That already is forced to be positive because of the odd nature. 
Um, so actually, I'm not going to have to worry about absolute value bars at all again. Okay? So here we go. Simplifying. What is a perfect square that comes out of 20? Well, 4 is in 20. So square root of 4 would be 2. And then we would have our 5 left over. 4 times 5 is 20. Okay, 2 goes into 3 one time with 1x left over. And 2 goes into y one time which gives me a final answer simplifying here of 6xy times root 5x. Okay. Next up, 3 and 4, cube roots. <coughs> well, cube roots, nice thing about that, I don't have to worry about absolute value bars. Again, as soon as you see an odd, you don't have to worry about absolute value. It's only if it's even and even, even index, even power, and ends up being odd that you have to put absolute value bars in. Okay? So multiplying, 3 is going to sit on the outside because it's the sole coefficient in this one. And then rewriting this, we have cube root of 24. x to the fifth times x is x to the sixth. y squared times y to the fifth is y to the seventh. Okay, we are cube rooting 24 here, so we are thinking about, well, what perfect cube goes into 24? Because 24 is not a perfect cube. Well, in this case, the cube root that goes into 24 would be 8. And the cube root of 8 is 2. When I pull the 8 out, what I'm left with is a 3. <coughs> okay. Next up, cube root of x to the 6. 3 goes into 6 two times, so this is x squared. Last but not least, y to the 7, 3 goes into 7, two times, with a y left over. So my final answer, 3 times 2 is 6, x squared times y squared times the cube root of 3y. Okay, number 4. Now we have coefficients on both ones, so we're going to go and multiply. Negative 2 times 2x cubed is negative 4x cubed. And we have the cube root of, underneath, 6 times negative 9 is negative 54. <coughs> x cubed times x is x to the fourth. And y times y to the sixth is y to the seventh. <coughs> Again, odd power, I'm sorry, odd indexes. So we don't need to worry about absolute value bars at all for this problem. Again, even powers with even indexes that end up being odd are where absolute value bars kick in. Okay? So now we're figuring out, well, my cube root, so the negative 4x cubed is there. What would be a perfect cube that goes into 54? Well, in this case, if I divided a 2 out, I would have negative 27. And negative 27 is a perfect cube. Negative 27, the cube root of that would be negative 3. And the 2 would stay. The 2 from that 54. Okay, x to the fourth. 3 goes into x to the fourth one time with 1x left over. And then y, 3 goes into 7 two times with two y's. I'm sorry, with one y left over. 3 goes into 7 twice with an, a remainder of 1. So simplifying this, negative 4 times 3 is 12. We have our, oh, and I just realized, I'm sorry, small typo here. I pulled that cube with the x as, as though the, this was x cubed, but that is the cube root <coughs> of negative 9. So this actually, when I multiplied initially, negative 2 times 2x cubed, should have been negative 4. I'm sorry, negative 2 times 2x should have been negative 4x, not negative 4x cubed, that cube root, or that cube was at the root here, right? So that would have been negative 4x, negative 4. So positive 12, x times x is x squared, y squared, and the cube root of 2xy. Okay.
Okay, next one. Um, reviewing, kind of converting with our, our, our powers here. So um, if you wanted to write a radical expression in an equivalent form using a rational exponent instead of a radical sign, you would use one of these properties. Um, and both of these, for the record, do use the principal root. So, for example, our conversion properties, a to the one half, when we see that fractional e exponent, the fractional exponent tells us that is the index of our radical. So this two down here is the index of my radical. We have root a. The n down here is my index of my radical, so we'd have the nth root of a. If you were ever looking at a function and there was a number other than one at the top, say maybe three over two instead of one over two, well then that number on top, that m, would either be attached to the a underneath your radical, or it would be applied to the radical as a whole. But still your denominator is your index of your radical. So still the n would be the index there. And then we have some properties of rational expressions, ones you've looked at over the years starting in I think seventh or eighth grade. Um, which are some we've even already used, which is that if you are, are multiplying like bases, you add their exponents. When um, you have a, a, a base with an exponent raised to an additional exponent, then we multiply the exponents, m times n. Okay? Um, I am allowed to distribute, I hesitate to say distribute, but it is kind of like distribute. I am allowed to um, apply the exponent individually to the different pieces within our parentheses as long as they are being multiplied, like a times b here. If this was a plus b or a minus b, then you'd have to do some sort of FOIL element to be able to expand that. But if they are being multiplied, I am able to individually apply the m to the a and then to the b. Negative exponents spin your fraction. So if this was in the top like it is here, my a to the m would go to the bottom. If my a to the negative m was already in the bottom, then the a to the m would move to the top. So it spins your fraction. When you are dividing like bases, you subtract their exponents. And then this last property is essentially the same as the one above it, which is, again, as long as they are not being added or subtracted. If you had any addition or subtraction in here, then it's a whole different story. But because these are being divided, which just means multiplying by the reciprocal, so because these are, are being multiplied or divided, I can apply the m individually, which is kind of like distribution, kind of. Okay? So walking through some of these, we are going to write each equation in its radical form and simplify. So we are taking our, our power here, our exponent, we are going to turn it into its radical form. And then yes, simplify if possible. Okay, so 27 to the 1 third, as soon as we see this fraction, we're thinking root. You look in the denominator to figure out what the root is, what the index is. And the numerator would be an additional power applied to your function if there is something other than 1. In this case, my denominator is 3, so this is a cube root. 27 is under the radical. And my additional power is 1, which doesn't impact a function at all. Anything to the 1 is itself. So we have the cube root of 27. Okay, well the cube root of 27 is 3. Okay, 8 to the 2 thirds is up next. So rewriting that again, fraction, q's radical, look in the denominator for your index. We have the cube root of 8, and then that is being squared. You can technically put the square, like what you see up above, underneath the radical or applied to the radical. I myself usually like to apply it to the radical only because a lot of times when you have a number under here, applying your power to it first before doing the root sometimes makes that number really, really, really big. And then you have to root it. You'd have to figure out well, what goes into that five times or three times or whatever your index happens to be. Cube rooting it first 
will make the number smaller, which usually makes raising it to the power of two or whatever your extra power is a little bit easier. So I usually recommend going small before going big. Do the root to the radical before the extra exponent. Okay, cube root of eight is two, squared is four. Okay. Number three, last one in this form, we have our 16 to the negative 0 0.75. I should say last one in this form on this page. We will then turn the page. Um, but 16 to the negative 0 0.75. First thing you definitely would want to do is figure out, okay, what is that as a fraction? Because um, if I'm going to rewrite as a, a radical, I need to see what the denominator is. So we have negative, and what is 0.75 as a fraction? 0.75 is 3 fourths, 3 quarters, 75 cents. Okay? So rewriting, we have our fraction denominator for my index, so this would be the fourth root of 16. And then again, you can cube initially or after the fact, whichever one you prefer. I'm going to do it after the fact. Okay? Because I don't, I don't want to figure out what 16 cubed is. <laughs> I, I, know, I know 16 squared, but I don't, even, I don't know what 16 cubed is, and I wouldn't want to do that. Um, so I'm going to fourth root it first, because that's going to make my number smaller, and then I can cube a small number. Okay? Fourth root of 16, what number times itself? So four of the same number goes into 16, and that would be 2. And 2 cubed is a lot nicer. 2 cubed is 8. Now this is a negative, so what does a negative do? It spins your fraction. So yes, this would have been 8 if it was just 2 cubed, but that negative drops that 8 down into the denominator. Okay. okay. Last page here, <coughs> three more, kind of practicing our properties. Okay, four, we have x to the negative one-half. Okay, so rewriting this in its radical form, we see our two down here, which is our, our index. This would be the root of x, and then an extra power of negative one. Well, what does a negative exponent do? It spins your fraction here, so this root x would go to the bottom. Okay. Okay, next one, we have 64th to the 1 half divided by 64th to the 1 third. So what property are we using here? Okay, we have the same base being divided, so what do we do to the exponents? We subtract them. Okay, so this is going to be 64 <coughs> to the 1 half minus 1 third. Well, to subtract those, I do need to find common denominators. So this would be 64 to the 3 6 minus 2 6, 1 half minus 1 third, which is 64 to the 1 6. Rewriting this one, looking at the denominator for my index, this would be the sixth root of 64. And then 1 is your extra power, but again, raising something to the power of 1 doesn't do anything. So I don't have to have it in there, but it would be there, technically speaking. So now you're having to ask yourself, well, what number times itself six times? Right, oh, I guess it's times it by itself five times, but six total times does that number when multiplied together, create 64. Um, and so this one might require a little testing or maybe a little factor tree to help you out, but two, six times, so two times two times two times two times two times two, times two <coughs> would be 64. Because two times two times two would be eight, two times two times two would be eight, and 8 times 8 is 64, so 6 twos 
would make 64. Okay, last one here, number six. We have 49 raised to the power of five halves, additionally raised to the power of three halves. Once again, you're asking yourself, what, what property am I using here? Okay, well, when I have a base raised to a, a power that's raised to an additional power, I multiply those exponents. This is 49 to the five halves times three fifths, multiplying my exponents. Well, five halves times three fifths, the fives would cross cancel, would be 49 to the three halves. Rewriting as a radical, denominator shows me my index, so this is root 49, and then cubed for my extra power. And again, another instance where I definitely would recommend doing the root first, because I, I wouldn't want to figure out what 49 cubed was, um, not by hand. Okay, so if we root first, it'll make our cube a little bit easier. Okay, cube root of 49 is 7. So now you're figuring out, well, what is 7 cubed? Again, you might not have that one memorized, that's okay, but you can figure it out, because 7 times 7 is 49, times an additional 7, so 3 7's would give you 7 cubed. This is 343. And again, you can figure that out by multiplying, if you didn't have that memorized. Okay? Okay, next up, number seven and eight, we're gonna go the opposite direction. We're gonna rewrite each expression in its exponential form rather than its radical. Okay, so taking a look at seven, we have our coefficient, which is negative. And then we have our y with its exponent of five and the fourth root, which that index shows me that this was a fraction. And so this would be negative y to the five-fourths. Okay, next one, we've got three x and y, which are all under the fourth root, and they are all raised to the eighth, so they're, they're all getting both of those pieces. Okay, so the three gets the eight, and the fourth root, which will be divided by four. The x gets the eight, and the fourth root. The y gets the eight, and the fourth root. Okay, eight over four is two, so this is three squared times x squared times y squared, which three squared is nine. Okay, 9, 10, and 11, we're going to be using these properties to simplify now. Okay, so number 9, looking at this, we see our, our terms here that are all raised to their own individual little powers that are all additionally raised to the two-thirds. And so what property can I use? Oh, I'm sorry, my projector just turned off. Give me a quick second here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what property can I use? Well, 27 to the, the 2 thirds, if I distributed that 2 thirds in, this would become 27 to the 2 thirds. We have x to the 9th times 2 thirds, which would be x to the 9th times 2 thirds, and y to the 1 half times two-thirds. Okay, cleaning this up, we have our cube root of 27, so cube root of 27, which has been squared, right? Nine times two-thirds, the three and the nine would cross simplify, so this would become x to the sixth, and my one half and two would cross simplify, leaving me with y to the one third. The cube root of 27 is three, squared is nine. 
And then we have our x to the sixth and our y to the one-third. Okay. Number 10. Okay, multiplying here, 6 times 12 is 72. And when we multiply like bases, we add their exponents. So this is x to the 2 thirds plus 3 sixths. Which finding common denominators then, um, this 2 thirds could become 4 sixths plus 3 sixths which four plus three is seven sixths. Okay, and then last but not least, number 11, we are looking at um, the quantity of 125x to the 12th over 64y to the 9th, all raised to the 1 -third. Okay, so distributing that 1 -third in, we'd have 125 to the 1 -third times x to the, multiplying these exponents, 12 times 1 third is 4, all over 64 to the 1 third, y to the 9 times 1 third is 3. Okay. And then one third means the cube root, so the cube root of 125, what times what times what would equal 125? That would be five, we have our x to the fourth, over 64, cube root of 64, what times what times what would be 64? That would be four <coughs> times y cubed. Okay. Okay, last set, rationalizing our denominators, reviewing that. So we're going to simplify each expression and then we're going to rationalize our denominators. We are, are going to assume that all of our variables are positive, just like we've been, we did in the prior ones, which means we don't have to worry about the absolute value bars. We're assuming they're positive already. Um, okay, so number 12, let's go ahead and simplify. Looking at this, does this simplify? Well, on top, nothing comes out of root 6, so that's going to stay root 6. There's no perfect square that goes into that one. But the square root of x to the 6th, 2 does go into 6 three times with no leftovers. For the record, this is where if we hadn't assumed the variables would be positive, we would have to slap absolute value bars around this piece. Oh, uh, never mind, I take that back, I'm sorry. <laughs> we would have if we didn't have this denominator down here. Um, pretending we didn't have the denominator down here. We would have to put absolute value bars around that piece because we had an even index with an even power that ended up odd. However, in the denominator, my x was already odd, okay? And so we don't have to worry about absolute values on the x, okay? In the denominator, simplifying that, we have our, our five, nothing simplifies out of root five. X, that does simplify a little bit. Two goes into three one time with a leftover X. And two goes into um, Y to the seventh here three times with a leftover Y. Okay. Next up, um, we are going to have to rationalize the denominator. Now before we do that, I am looking at this and seeing that there's an x cubed and an x in common. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify those real quick. We have our, they, they would cross off, the x would go away, this would reduce by one power. So we'd have x squared times root 6 over y cubed times root 5xy. Okay. So rationalizing the denominator, that means multiplying top and bottom by this radical, by our root 5xy. Okay, and actually, I didn't leave myself enough room, so sorry, give me a second. I'm going to rewrite this just as it is. Okay, multiplying top and bottom by root 5xy, we would have on top our x squared 
Multiplying these roots together, this would be root 30xy. On bottom, the square roots would cancel, which would leave me with y cubed times 5xy, which allows a little bit more simplification here because there's an x on bottom. That could simplify with one of the x's on top. So my numerator now would be x times root 30xy all over 5 and y cubed times y is y to the fourth. Number 13, Let me go ahead and bubble this in to keep our work separate. <coughs> okay, number 13, simplifying first. Well, in the numerator, nothing simplifies. Root five would stay root five. In the denominator, nothing simplifies. Root 10a, nothing comes out of that that's a perfect square. So the only other thing we could do here is 21 and 14 would simplify. There's a seven that comes out of both of them which would give me 3 root 5 over 2 root 10a. Now I'm going to rationalize the denominator, which means multiply top and bottom by that root 10a, which means my top here now is the 3 of the coefficient, and root 5 times 10 is 50a over two times the roots would cancel 10a. Now this does simplify because there is a perfect square that comes out of 50. 25 is my perfect square that comes out of 50, so this would be pulling that, that 5 out, so 25, root 25 would be 5. I'd have 3 times 5 over down here, 20a, and left over after I pulled the 25 out would be a root 2a. And then the 5 would cancel with the 20, which gives me a final answer of 3 root 2a over 4a. Okay. Last Last one, um, simplify and rationalizing the denominator. I should say last one in this row and then we have three more. Simplify and rationalizing the denominator. We are looking for what is something that goes into, in this case, 27 four times. Okay, there's nothing that goes into 27 four times. So now we're gonna rationalize the denominator. Um, there are a couple of different ways you could do that. Honestly, the fastest way is figuring out what's missing. What if it was part of my 27 here? What if I, if I tucked it in with the 27 would allow me to actually simplify? In this case, 27 is three, three times, right? It's three cubed. It'd be really nice if it was three to the fourth because then I'd be able to simplify, right? Well, because it's already three cubed, we already have three threes and we need one more, the fastest way to rationalize this denominator would be to multiply by the fourth root of three. Because now when I multiply these two in the denominator, the numerator would be just fourth root of three. That's what one times fourth root of three is. But now when I rationalize my, de by my denominator, the fourth root of 27 times the fourth root of three, I have four threes down there, right? This is three cubed and another three, so three to the fourth total. Well, four divided by four would be one, and so I'd be left with just the one three. Okay, last row here. We have our two over the cube root of five, so simplifying first, nothing simplifies. Nothing comes out of any of these. There's nothing that can simplify top, bottom. So then we're looking at, okay, well, what 
how could I rationalize this? Again, this is not a, a nice square root. It's one a little bit more like 14 here where we had that fourth root. Um, so on 15, again, the, the fastest way to rationalize this denominator would be to ask yourself, well, what, what could I add to that denominator so that it did work out evenly? It did reduce evenly. Okay, well, in this case, I have one five. How many would I like to have? Three, right? It's a cube root. If I had three fives, the threes would cancel and I'd be left with five. Well, I want three, I've got one, so what do I need to add in? Two more. I want the cube root of five squared. The cube root of five squared. Because now I will have three fives when I multiply these together, so the three fives, the five cubed, will cancel with the cube root, which will leave me with just five in the denominator. On top, we have our two and our cube root of five squared, which is 25. Okay. Next up, 16. Okay, looking at this, trying to reduce and rationalize. Nothing reduces in this one. There's nothing that comes out evenly. So then we're looking at, okay, well, let's rationalize the denominator. Another one like 14 and 15 where you're looking at it going, okay, well, what would I like to have in there? Um, and again, there's several different ways to walk through this, okay? But the one way is looking at this nine and going, okay, well, I've got, I've got two threes there. It would be really nice if I had three threes because then the, the cubed and the cube root could cancel. Okay, well, since I already have two, let's add one more in. Now I'll have three and the cube root and the three, the cubed will, will cancel, which will leave me with just three. I also have two x's. It would be really nice if I had a third x. Okay, well, give yourself a third x. Because now the cube root and the cube will cancel, leaving me with just x. Okay, cube root of 3x on top as well. So this would be 12 times the cube root of 3x, which does simplify. 3 and 12 simplify to make 4. So my answer would be 4 times the cube root of 3x all over x. Last one, number 17. Okay, looking to see, does this simplify at all? Is there anything that can, can come out of either the top or the bottom or simplify top and bottom? Nope, not in this case. So then we're looking at, okay, rationalizing the denominator. Again, another one that's not a, a nice clean square root, so you're gonna be looking for, for cube roots in this case. <coughs> so what do we already have? what would we like to add in to make our problem a little bit easier? Okay, in this case, I already have a six, okay? I only have one six, or I should say I have, I have one two and one three, which is one six. I'd like two more, okay? So two more sixes, so we, we're looking at six squared here. I have two x's already, so I'd like one more. And I have one y, so I'd like two more. Same thing on top. Okay, well the nice thing about that is in my denominator now, one six, two more sixes, so six cubed. Cubed cancels with cube root, leaving with just six. Two x's, one x, so x cubed cancels with the cube root, leaving with just x. And y, one y times two y's, y cubed, cancels with the cube root, leaving me with just y. In the top here, you could do 12 times 36 if you'd like, but notice, we have two sixes over here. How many do I have over here? We've got one and a leftover two, but we've got a six in there. So one six and two more makes three sixes. And so then the cube root of six cubed would be six. <coughs> With
with my leftover 2 from that 12. And then my x and my y squared, which have nothing to combine to in that, the other numerator, so we're just putting them under our cube root. Okay, well the 6 is simplify, which gives me a final answer of the cube root of 2xy squared all over xy. And so there's review of radical expressions.